Let's have a look at covariate shift with a little bit more mathematical detail. So this is entirely optional for the purpose of this course, but I thought that it might be actually quite useful. So the first thing is, well, rather than designing a classifier, you could also say, well, okay, well, we have a GAN and we can use a GAN to, you know, generate, you know, some data that looks like, you know, the test set and then, you know, things are okay, right? And as a matter of fact, you could do, you could build a generator and the only difference to a regular generator as what most people use when they want to, you know, generate photos of, you know, humans, for instance, is that our generator just takes the original data and resamples it. So if you think about it, this is the original data. And now it, you know, just maybe at random spits out observations, but with those sampling probabilities rather than uniform ones. And the task of the poor discriminator is to try to distinguish between training and test data. So therefore, I mean, this is, you know, exactly the GAN objective, right? So we have, want to minimize over alpha. So this is the generative part, and this is the adversarial part, and here is our network. And so now our generator can play with the alphas then this is the, you know, training set. This is the test set. And what we want is that training and test data are sufficiently indistinguishable. Okay. And so there's a theorem which shows that this is minimized for alpha equals Q over P. So how would we prove this? Let's have a look at it on a you know, per covariate basis, right? So let's assume we only have a single X. Now for a single X, what we can do is we can have, we have basically, you know, C log R of Y equals one given X plus D log R of Y equals minus one given X, right? So one is, you know, the training set, the other one is the test set. And just in general, if I have this expression, I can just go and, you know, pull out C plus D and, you know, divide again. So I just get this fra those fractions, right? Nothing's changed. So now this is obviously nothing else than gamma and one minus gamma and those weights are, you know, less than one and they sum up to one. So that's exactly why I could easily, you know, pull out C over C plus D and D over C plus D as gamma and one minus gamma now, if I want to maximize this with regard to rho, so basically if with regard to, you know, this term here, then, you know, the largest I can achieve. So, I mean, again, what I did is I just renamed this as rho and one minus rho, just because if mathematical expressions look simple, sometimes it's also a lot easier to find the solution. Anyway, so if you take the derivative with regard to rho, then you find out that rho equals gamma is exactly the term for which this is optimized. So in other words, I get minus C plus D times H of gamma and minimizing the entropy with regard to gamma, therefore, you know, gives us gamma equals one half. After all, remember that's the entropy for a binary distribution right, here's zero, here's one. That's basically, you know, this case here, gamma, here's H of gamma. And you can see that the entropy has its mode at one half, and that gives us exactly the situation where the two distributions are no longer distinguishable. And well, that's exactly what we wanted, right? Because if they're not distinguishable, then the adversary can do nothing more. And that means my GAN has converged. <clears throat> now plugging this knowledge back into the integrals that we have, because remember we don't have just a single covariate X, 
but you know x can take on a lot of different you know values so therefore the optimality that we just derived on the previous slide so remember that was basically this term here without the integrals that has to hold now for all possible values of x and so what I can do is I can pull out the integral you know dq of x out here and I get alpha times p of, a, p of a q plus this term here and then now all I have to do is I basically you know work out optimality so that's what we had before and I get that alpha equals q over p. The reason why this was a little bit more complicated is that we had two moving parts namely we had the generator and we had the network right. The adversary was fine but the network needed to be found and this is exactly you know what you know therefore you know I do with R and so assuming that R takes the optimal step the optimal step for alpha is to pick exactly q over p. So if we go back to slides remember this was the generator right here we have the adversary and here we have the network that's given by that and you know we show that the adversary the best thing that it can do is to actually hunt for the entropy mode and then sorry the yeah for and then you know that's given at one half anyway so using optimality once you work this all through gives us alpha is you know q over p which is exactly what we had before and that's a good thing it just means that if I use again then I'll get the same answers as if I'd use the classifier as and it's the same answer as you know what you can do by deriving it from probability theory so in short the world's a good place because all the various pieces give me the same answer. Okay there are more connections and you can actually show that if you were to set this up as a max end problem again you will get the same answer and in this case what you would do is you would say I want to find a distribution that has maximum entropy under the constraint that the empirical averages between two distributions match or they're at least bounded by some epsilon because you have finite sample size effects if you do that there's a long paper uh, that we wrote almost 10 years well over 10 years ago and it will give you exactly the same answer this is just there for completeness so you can see that a lot of different tools give you the same answer. Okay so this sounds great let's actually see what happens in practice. So this is a fairly famous or maybe infamous study and basically Bolan Vimi and Gebru in 2018 asked a very very important question namely are our AI systems biased? And they had this idea that, well, for instance, they can test it for gender estimation and to try and see whether the error estimate for gender estimation is different, whether you have a fair skin or a dark skin. So the examples that they picked, was they said, okay, let's actually pick a set of, pick a demographic that, you know, is the same throughout, namely medical, uh, well, not medical doctors, sorry, uh, parliamentarians and so they essentially looked at various countries Finland, Iceland and Sweden and Rwanda, Senegal and South Africa amongst others and they looked at their you know faces the reason why they picked Northern Europe I guess is probably because people tend to have fairer skin there and you know if you look at that furthermore these are the kind of average faces that you get from you know male and female respectively in you know various countries. You can see that you know in Sweden yes people tend to be quite fair-haired and fair-skinned. Now this is actually an example of a much bigger problem namely that quite often if I want to for instance perform face recognition and so on I have demographic attributes that often correlate with cultural behavior and cultural attributes and I'm sort of kind of giving away the punchline here but basically the 
problems that they found in the PPB, so Pilot Parliament's benchmark, um, are largely explained by just, you know, conditioning on the wrong demographics. So let, let me be more specific about what happens. So there are four faces from the left to the right. And the face on the very left is the average British young man's face. Okay, so there's some consensus estimate, probably used, you know, Celebe or whatever, so, and he does look handsome. And you can see all of his face, his ears, his hair, everything's great. So a face recognizer for him would work probably quite well. Now, as we move from left to right, we see a gentleman who has very luxuriant hair and some beard. Then the gentleman further on the right is wearing sporting sunglasses. And then the one on the very far right even also wears a headscarf, so a turban. And he's a sick and he's apparently some very famous designer, but I did forget his name. But basically what you see is that, you know, as the face in this case becomes increasingly obscured, it actually becomes harder to, for instance, in this case, recognize people. Now, that's unfortunate, and it just so happens that in some cases, those attributes, like, you know, covering your head, or maybe growing a beard, tend to be correlated with some cultural and demographic attributes. And unfortunately, well, if I don't see a face very well, then, you know, my face recognizer might not work so well. And that, well, just so happens to be obviously a problem, but it's not a problem of the face recognizer being, you know, racist. It just happens to be an issue of, you know, important and in some cases protected demographics exhibiting behavior that makes certain algorithms work better or well, or better or worse. Okay, so back to the face recognition accuracy. So what they found is something that actually looked pretty alarming. So they compared, you know, three commercial systems, systems A, B, and C, and they also looked at, you know, the errors on, you know, Celeb and ResNet Celeb A and Fairface. And what they found is that, well, dark-skinned men and especially dark-skinned women have a much higher error rate. And in this case, I think the goal was gender classification. And so if you just look at it as it is, you would say, well, you know, the system is probably, you know, not working very well for dark-skinned women and maybe this, you know, there's some racial bias in it. So there's a lot of reasons for alarm. Okay. And you know, the story could have stopped there, but um, as you can see, there's space below on the slide. Um, so what actually happened is, uh, so Balakrishnan et al. Um, went and looked at, for instance, the hair length for, and they looked at other attributes too, but the hair length is probably the most striking one for on those different data sets. Now, in particular, if you look at, uh, you know, what happened here, you can see that if you are a dark-skinned man, man, and so let me explain what this is. So there are violin plots for both fair and dark-skinned and female and male. And this is on three different data sets. So Celeb A, FFHQ, and PPB. And what you can see is that if you, for instance, train on a Celeb A HQ, then you know, you're missing out on a very important part here, namely, if you're a woman and you're in politics in, in Africa, you apparently do not have short, long hair, or at least it's highly desirable to have really short hair. Furthermore, if you're a man, you almost would go and shave your head, or at least have some very, very shortly, tightly cropped hair. Whereas in most of those other data sets, I mean, they are men with, you know, sometimes luxuriously flowing hair. Now, what does that mean? It means that the data set that they tested the algorithms on has been significantly shifted from the original source. So if you will, 
if this was the original source, now they went and picked, you know, some data set where this is, you know, a bit different. And they got quite alarming results. So the question then is, you know, what can be done about it? And, you know, is there really bias? So the first thing that, you know, Balakrishnan et al. did is they tried to see what happens if you strat, you know, compensate for age. And the good thing is that by now GANs are actually good enough that you can build GANs that will realistically vary those attributes and you can disentangle them such that, you know, age and facial hair don't necessarily, you know, correlate that much. The reason being, well, okay, if you're 15, you probably don't have facial hair and actually the chance of wearing facial hair actually increases with age. So you don't want necessarily those attributes, you know, to be related because again, otherwise you could, you know, fall prey to the same thing. The second thing that they, and so if you look at hair length here, you know, this person has very short hair and here she has very long hair, likewise there. Um, so, and you still see a little bit of, you know, entanglement. So the hair color changes with the hair length, right? And that's something that you may not want, but the point being, those are fairly realistically looking faces. Now they don't just really look realistic to you and me. What they did is they actually tested this. They wanted to make sure that the faces that the GANs produced looked as good and as real as the real ones, right? Because otherwise you could just say, well, you know, maybe the system just doesn't pick up on the, you know, racial bias issues on synthetic data, right? So they wanted to be sure they controlled for everything that disentangled things and they also vetted it with humans. And, you know, drum roll, please. What happened is that once you actually control, so you have the same distribution on training and test set, well, suddenly all the, you know, bias goes away. So for instance, the light skinned males and the dark skinned males behaved about the same. And likewise for the women, you know, they were within error bars of each other. Now, this is a very different, dramatically different result from what you saw above. And the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, why is there no system A, B, and C? Well, because this study was done all by Amazonians and we only used our own data because, well, we wanted to make sure we report accurate findings on our own deployed service rather than on something else because after all, we understand our own service best. So now this sounds like magic, but actually this is a very, very common thing. And it's a very simple thing. Now you can use that little lemma for good or for bad. So let's assume that we have some loss L of Y and F of X, and I have some mean, you know, some risk and I have some variance that depends, you know, on P and F and you know, under the assumption that the variance is non-zero, then I can fi always find the distribution Q of X such that the risk that, you know, is incurred, incurred on that distribution Q is greater or equal than the original risk plus some sigma. And actually that's, you know, not very surprising. It just means, well, if there is some diversity in risk, then I can always go and find, you know, those observations where my system does worse. And if I then specifically focus on that, I will get very different results on those terms. Now the proof is super simple. This is really just the mean value theorem because it just says, well, if you have a certain variance, there has to be at least some observations for which this, you know, the risk deviates from the expected risk by at least, you know, that standard deviation. And that's exactly what you pick. So if you just focus on the bad cases, then you can show that your system works badly. I'm not insinuating at all that this is what happened, the Buolam Vimy and Gebru paper. I think they very honestly asked the right questions, namely, is there bias in the system? But the analysis, 
well, if they'd caught those issues, then maybe their findings would have been slightly different. So key takeaways, well, you can always find a distribution that makes it worse. So be aware of it. You may want to do something about really poor performance on some cases. And that gets us into the entire issue of, you know, is it equitable to take a performance hit for the majority in order to do better for, my, for a minority or not? And this gets us into decisions that are best not made by algorithms, but by humans, right? Now, the other thing you want to do is you want to make sure that, you know, you have proper matching between training and test set before you can draw conclusions. You can fix covariate shift through GANs, you can fix it through classifiers, you can fix it through MMD and maximum entropy, and a lot more of those things. But just be aware of the fact that if you just use a feature-based method alone, then not all of those feature-based methods are sufficient. So for instance, if you look at, you know, the FID, so the fresh inception distance and other things, yes, it's a useful score, but you can in some cases then also break it just by, you know, exploiting the fact that the configuration space of distributions is much larger than what the FID catches. Okay. This is really just a quick aside if you've worked on GANs and related things before. Otherwise, this concludes the issue of covariate shift.